Okay, so to set the stage for our talk tonight, which is what we learned from the COVID pandemic year, my wonderful team um, has put together a little video for you. We need help to cover this market, and we've got it. David Barnson is here. This virus spreading yeah. outside China, the word pandemic is being used, and that's affecting the market again. We don't know how bad it's going to get from a health standpoint. The market is up 4.5% since the bottom level of coronavirus three weeks ago. We think that this is a coronavirus panic much more than a Bernie Sanders story. Your thoughts on the fair trade, how long it lasts? Um, if I know the answer to that, I would be sharing it with you privately. <laughs> so I do want to say no one else knows either, Charles. That's the important part. We do uh, a lot of work to make sure that our clients stay calm and understand our perspective. Behavioral finance drives investor results. seen a situation where the outcomes in the short term, by short term I mean three to six months, are so diverse. We could be into a recession and we literally could bounce back 30, 40 percent. This was something that came so quickly and so violently, but I felt that we were very prepared in this sense. We're religious asset allocators. So you can look and say markets down 25%, but look at a portfolio and say down eight, nine, 10%. I don't want to be down 10% and I don't want our equities down 20s, but that asset allocation story really worked. Well, I apologize in advance, but I'm just not going to answer the question about whether or not we've seen a bottom. There's one honest answer for you, Stuart, and one honest answer for our viewers, and that is nobody knows. really is about excessive government spending. Eventually, the next tool to your question that the Fed's going to pull out is some better form of monetization, the Japanification of our economy, because we have too much government debt and its spending is not getting yeah. under control and it's not getting going to get under control. You, you, you wrote this in response to the fact that a lot of big corporations have already announced they're kicking the can down the road for bringing employees back. You lay out the cascading effect. Yes, you got to protect small business, but when big businesses wait, bad things happen. The part that's being ignored is the impact to all those downstream throughout the city, the dry cleaners, the coffee shops, the restaurants. There's a total ecosystem that's being ignored. Now, I know and you know, Pete, that the mayor isn't going to do anything about that. The leadership has to come from these very capable mm -hmm. and resourceful business leaders. Well, Charles, in fairness to my view here, the market is up eight of the last nine days. And those are the eight days where it's been very clear they weren't getting a stimulus deal done. I mean, you're up 2000 points since they first hit a stalemate from COVID in the health side to the market's way of dealing with this. You have a lot of indicators where society is saying we're ready to move on. You people leave us alone. What's your take on where we are in this recovery? The thing that we keep telling clients, Maria, is that it isn't so much about where the COVID news goes. It's where the policy response ends up being. That's the hard to predict element. If you care about the economic prospects of those who are more disenfranchised, more disadvantaged, you yes. cannot support the idea of staying shut down. We need to get back to work, open schools, open businesses, and let this virus run its course. That does not mean not protecting the vulnerable. What you don't see 
is the record number of new business license applications taken out for all these failed businesses that are basically being forced into failure, of course, by the, the tragedy of the pandemic and the policy decisions. But yet there are new businesses that are starting to take their place. This entrepreneurial spirit that is embedded in the DNA of Americans has not gone anywhere. And I think it will end up being the major story of 2021. Um, I was trying to count how many different settings there were. I, there was one point where I was being interviewed by Maria Bartiroma, and I was talking about asset allocation uh, earlier in the video clip. And that was March 13th. That was that day uh, I was in New York, and I was on set that Friday morning taping that show for her Friday Wall Street week. And then that night is the night that I flew home, and I haven't been back in a TV studio since. And, and so they started doing a lot of interviews um, uh, during the quarantine via Skype. And you notice there was uh, my, my home office in, in Newport in a bunch and home office in New York. And then, and then we have a studio in New York, a studio here. And we, when you see the backdrop, that's where we, we were back in our studio. They just weren't, weren't back in theirs. And a little secret, if you want to know if the anchor was back in the studio or not, just look at their hair. <laughs> um, so they, they are talking about, you know, being able to open back up the studios and stuff in New York. But we, we, we did a lot of those types of things th throughout the, the quarantine period. And obviously over the course of this COVID year, um, we've been very, very religiously faithful about continuing with the weekly podcast, the videos, our, our own writing. And, and that Dividend Cafe commentary that I do every Friday that was born itself, even though it wasn't called Dividend Cafe back then, it was just my weekly market commentary. I did an email form back at Morgan Stanley. That was born out of the crisis that was the 2008 uh, financial crisis, literally the week in which it looked like Morgan Stanley was going down, Lehman had already gone down, Merrill had gone down, and I started doing it. And it kind of evolved into Dividend Cafe. And apparently I was less ambitious back then because it was a weekly offering. And then in the midst of this whole experience and, and whether or not everyone in the country was going to die and if the market was going to zero and all the things going on, I began doing this COVID and markets missive. And I think Jolene and Brian would know, but I think we started it near the very end of March. We kind of formalized it and got it into our website and branded it probably early April. But I had been doing kind of an email form, you know, just a couple of weeks into all the, all the things. And, and that was a daily offering. And for a long time, I was doing it even on the weekends. But there was that much to say. I would, I assure you, there, was, there was not a single day that I wrote COVID to markets where I was struggling with like material. Okay, there, there was plenty there. And now I hope a lot of you receive the daily offering we do, the DC today, because that was kind of born out of COVID and markets. And, um, you know, I love doing it. I love the writing. I love the reading. Um, if I wasn't an early morning person, I couldn't do it. You know, by the time all of you are awake and my team is awake and the markets are open, there's very little writing getting done. But because I'm up so early, I'm really able to, to focus into it and then add and clean up what needs later in the day before we go to publish. But that, that's a, a fun thing that's come out of this whole awful experience. And we plan to keep that going in perpetuity. You know, I... Um, the, 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 the kind of trip down memory lane, so to speak, I talked about this, this event we had here at the Country Club and the last time we had gotten together. But I don't, and I've written already a bit about that week I was in New York and, and coming back. Look, I can sit there and, and reminisce about awful things in my life and positive things in my life all day. First of all, because I have a, a ridiculously proficient and detailed memory. And second of all, I truly am a nostalgic person and it's easy for me to just sort of get going on all this stuff. But the memory lane of this is very different for, for everyone else. I would hope that most of your memories of late February through late March of 2020 are not fully and completely encapsulated around what was happening in the market day by day. Now, it must have been to some point because of the, the horror of what was happening and undoubtedly the fear and emotion that would have gone along with it. But probably for most people, 
there was also, along with the market sensation of what was happening in the COVID moment, all sorts of other things going on, where you were going to be and where your family was and where you, you know, all, all the kind of logistical stuff and whatnot. And I, and we had all of that too. And Jolene and I had things going on, the kids and school and, you know, the, all of it. And, and, and all the personal side to it, I'll remember all those details forever. But there's just no way that I'm ever going to associate the events of a year ago with anything other than the, the events of the stock market. This is what I'm on earth to do is manage money for my clients. This is what our team does. And relationally and emotionally, these are the times in which we earn our fees to be there as a resource for people during difficult and painful times. Sometimes they have to say stuff they don't really mean and we have to listen to it. Sometimes they really mean it and that, that's okay too, I guess. It depends. <laughs> Let me get back to you on that. But it was, I want to be really clear because I was watching the video the other day and texting Jolene about some stuff. The video is hard for me to watch because this, it was an awful month and, and it was not clients leaving or clients mad. Nothing like that was going on. It, that uncertainty now, it isn't uncertainty now. You've seen the movie. At the time, we were, as far as we knew, in the first scene of the movie. That's the degree of uncertainty that was out there and the need. And I don't just mean um, best practice. I mean the moral, legal ethical obligation I have to you to not let you do something stupid in that moment is profound. And that's a weight that, that I carry because that's what you pay me to carry. So there's not a lot of sleep, there's not a lot of health, all that stuff, but, but, then, but then here we are, right? And, and there was a point and you could see, I, there, was, there was some moment by maybe summertime where I became utterly incensed about some of the things that were going on. And at that point, the market had, had largely recovered. The, the economy had started to process both the, how awful things got and, and the direction of its kind of inevitable recovery. A lot of the, the economic aspects for those of us in our world was significantly better, significantly different. Not everyone, not every industry, not every job, but we were out of the woods, meaning the woods of March and April of last year. You, I hope you know what I mean. And it hit me that for as much sort of resolution and comfort and relief that a lot of us felt and I felt, there was none of that for people that worked at a coffee shop on Madison Avenue. And that there wasn't going to be. And it's pretty much as best I can tell, no one cares. No, they, they, it's just, well, it is what it is. So the, I got to a point by the end of 2020, but a little earlier than that, where I felt guilty for how unsettled March and April had been from how unsettling March and April had been for me, because I realized that in the grand scheme of things, it felt awful at the time. I felt awful for my clients who were feeling awful. There was all the uncertainty about what, what was going on in the world and the whole thing. But compared to a significant amount of population, I just felt incredibly humbled, incredibly grateful for the lot that we have. And I just share that with you because I hope some of you could feel the same. There's been a ton of frustration. Some of you have been sick. Some of you have had loved ones who have been sick. Uh, there's been uh, an incredible um, weight that this is all represented for our country. And, that, and that's affected everyone, and I get that. But it has affected some people worse than others. And most of us are not in that worst list. And, and that's just something I'm, I'm profoundly grateful for. There's the memory lane of it all. So let's talk lessons. This is not good news. A lot of the lessons tonight are really good. Okay. Very positive. But this is something that on a really big scale, we saw in the middle of March of 2020. And this is something that in the biggest of all scales, we saw throughout September and October and in Jan of 2008, January and February of 2009. And then in a kind of more miniature scale, there's been little spurts of the same lesson in January of 2016, in August of 2015, in July of 2011. Um, th those were some of the periods where all of a sudden you get some selling that becomes a cascade of selling and it has nothing to do 
with what is being sold. You do not get in a levered financial system security prices, asset prices, risk assets that go from here to here because it was worth this and now people are worried it's worth this. It goes from here to here because somewhere on the way down, people don't care anymore what it's worth. They have no opinion about where it's going. They need cash because they're levered and they can't sell the, the things that they want to sell. They go illiquid or the prices are so disconnected that they begin selling indiscriminately. The concept of this is not new from 2008, 2011, 2015, COVID, these different moments I talk about. By the way, 2011 was the, the European debacle that, that led into the U.S. debt downgrade. 2015 in August was the first round of tensions with China and them devaluing their currency. And January of 16 was more China-related stress. Those are kind of, and you had about three days of Brexit-related stress in the summer of 2016, but, but um, that didn't ever really cascade to the same degree. So I'm kind of skipping over that peak to trough. 1987, for those of you that were investing then or around then, or in my case, wearing a tie, a clip on tie to school then, the fact of the matter is that that's all 1987's Black Monday was, was a really overheated market. It, it got some warning indicators. There was nowhere near the technology that there is now. There was more selling the system could handle, and then that leverage broke down and all hell broke loose, and, and the Dow dropped 22% uh, in a single day. Um, so a levered financial system, there is not a regulator that's going to fix this. There is not a technology tool that's going to fix this. And there's not a portfolio manager that's going to fix this. When there's a cascade of selling of risk assets relative to, to the amount of buyers, then prices get disconnected from reality. This is the bad news, but I want to set the expectation. The good news is it doesn't seem to be lasting very long these days. There's more liquidity, more efficiency. Forget, you know, uh, a CARES Act and, and bailouts and TARP. For, and even for a moment, forget the Fed's interventions. All of that stuff matters, though. We'll get back to it. But there are more hedge funds, often demonized. But they see disconnections, they come in and become buyers. They become liquidity providers. There are sometimes the ability to, to neutralize the effect of cascaded selling because there are people being more opportunistic. Um, I remain to this day very candidly, I said it over and over again from March 16th, which was the worst day of all the market action last year. The market was down 3,000 points on Monday, March 16th after being down 2,000 points on Thursday, March 12th, and 2,000 points Monday, March 9th, and 4,000 points the last week of February. So you basically had this whole thing where we went down about 12,000 points, and all of it was in four days. But it didn't feel like that because there were other you know, rebounds and recoveries and the roller coaster of it all, but the net-net number. Another thing I'll share with you, and I wrote about this a lot in COVID and markets, all of the stuff I'm talking about didn't happen during market hours. I mean, maybe the market would open down 1,200 and, and close down 1,600. But for the most part, all the big recovery days, the market opened up huge in the futures market. And certainly the down days, we were coming in down 1,000 points. And the only reason why we weren't down 2,000 is because they have what they call trips that kind of keep the market from being able to execute those sales pre-market. So, so anyways, the point I'm making is this is a risk you live with, and it's a risk that um, I, I am painfully aware of, but that in the moment, when all of this is cascading, and you look at something on your screen that is so wildly disconnected from reality, and you say, why am I not backing up the truck and buying this with both hands? Because that is something you say a month later, after it's recovered or a year later when you're standing up on stage and at the country club. In that moment, there, people understandably don't have the appetite and tolerance for it. And, and of course, it presupposes the idea that one is picking the bottom, which is, which is not necessarily reality at all. Um, so so the, the realities going forward are there is no possible way 
the system will stay delevered. It has already relevered to some degree. Risk parity hedge funds are not as relevered as they were a year ago. Global macro is not as relevered, but they will. Why wouldn't they? It's not illegal. It's their money. It's their investor money. They make more money when they're levered than when they're not. So they're going to relever. And then the next time all hell breaks loose, geopolitical event, economic event, recessionary event, God forbid, global pandemic event, all of this happens again. Now, how many times has it happened throughout your lifetime? Well, let's just start from me when I was in, when I was in uh, starting high school. It was 1987. It was um, maybe once or twice in the 1990s around uh, global events. It was 9-11. It was the financial crisis. There's a couple of the moments I talked about in 2010 decade, most didn't last long, and then it was COVID, four or five times. So that cascading selling, where is a bottom, is this time different, that panic level, I don't know how one can formulate investment policy around avoiding it. Like you have, you have 40, 50 years of investing in front of you, of living in front of you, of spending in front of you, of drawing in front of you, of legacies to your children and your grandchildren and your charities, and you're supposed to make an investment decision on something that's happened four or five times in the last 50 years. I mean, give me a break. But it sucks. It just does. And that risk becomes a source of the risk premium that feeds us as equity investors. Lesson two is probably something that I would say to everyone in the room, because I know my clients, I know the folks that wanted to do different, I know the folks who didn't do different, uh, you know, and I said it before, uh, uh, what people say and so forth, we're, we're pretty thick skinned and that's all fine, but the only thing we can't do is, if someone actually doesn't follow our advice, you know, we can't be responsible for that, but our clients follow our advice, right? I mean, that's that's the beauty of, the relationship we have with clients, um, I can't take a fee from somebody for following advice that doesn't follow advice, so that means I can't take the fee from them. But our clients um, did not necessarily buck the trend of people that were miserable during the COVID moment. They were, they were all of you know what I'm saying. It was, it was that level of uncomfort, that level of, of vulnerability. The market had gone up from the middle of 2016 Remember, middle of 14 to middle of 16, you guys all know the market actually was dead flat, which is really odd because we think of all those years, the calendar year 14, calendar year 15, calendar year 16, market was up all those years. It was barely up in 15. But the reality is that for a 24-month period, the S&P 500 was flat, middle to middle. For the middle of 16, and then remember 2017, market was up huge. 2018, market was down a little bit, but by January 3rd, of 2019, I'm not exaggerating, all of the 2018 losses were made up. And then 2019 was a huge year up. So you had 2017, 2019, huge years. None of this has anything to do with who was president. I only say it as a marker for timing purposes. In the COVID months, the market got back to the level it was when President Obama left office. We gave up four years of returns in less than four weeks. So who wouldn't be unsettled by that? And yet, the ability to add behavioral wisdom, which is, which is a mental proposition, to discipline, which is a character proposition, together being the foundation of investment success, that's not going to change. There's never going to come a time where your successful financial outcomes are dependent upon you bought this stock and didn't buy that stock. It's not going to happen. On the margin, certain stock selection decisions and timing things and so forth can always impact basis points of return, but not outcomes. But outcomes can be permanently altered by the decisions one makes. The reason to not sell out of the market one year ago today, and the Dow hit 18,213 in the middle of the day, closed at 18,591. One year ago today, the low of the market. The reason to have not sold at that time was not because we knew the market had bottomed, because we didn't, and I didn't. The reason was because whether the market went on to hit 17, 16, 15. Do you understand what we knew on March 23rd? They were testing nationwide about 10 people a day for COVID. Like they weren't even close to knowing what was going on with coronavirus. Not even close. The peak of deaths in New York City 
were two and a half weeks away. They were fully expecting at that point that the hospital system was going to be overrun. They were wrong about a lot of the stuff. But on March 23rd, when the market bottomed, there wasn't a single piece of good news to drive a turnaround. The reason to have stayed with an asset allocated, properly constructed investment plan, experiencing what we call left tail risk, a severe risk, a black swan event, one of these cascading leveraged financial moments. The reason to stay with the plan was simply because the, the stakes are too big otherwise. To get out of the market and have it rebound, the problem with the percentages of these, you notice from the, from the, 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 the reel, all of a sudden, when you were now kind of grinding through market recovery, it wasn't 18, it wasn't 19, it was 22, 23, 25, 26. Well, what is the percentage move from 18,000 to 24,000? It's 33%. You blink and you miss 33% of recovery. And then do you want back in? Because you're not going to do it. People don't do it. People that panic out at the bottom can't bring themselves to get back in because then pride and then regret kicks in. And then the regret ruins their financial life. It's, a, it's, it's the reason why the plan has got to be constructed right and the adherence to the plan, wisdom, discipline, creates that investment success. The, the, the notion that markets can drop outside one's comfort zone very quickly and that they do just that is not really that different from the first point I made about the leveraged financial system. All I'm trying to do here with this point, it, it, the first point about the leveraged financial system is to give you some inside baseball as to why these things happen. And why, by the way, they happen, see, everyone's talking about the stock market. I know some of you in the room know better. But you know what got really disconnected from reality? Is triple A municipal bonds is is high quality mortgage bonds. They couldn't get a buyer. So when there was a liquidity mismatch, it had nothing to do with the S&P 500 or the Russell 2000. All assets were disconnected and spreads blow out in bonds in, in any different kind of risk asset class. That's what I mean by the levered financial system. On the comfort zone level, I try my best because we had that long bull market. And I know how many times I stood up here in this room for annual dinner and in the front room there in the, in, the, in the boardroom on the other side for the quarterly dinners. I know my own writing. I know how many times I say the words because I believe them. I know them intellectually. I know you need to know them intellectually. But I also know it's not the same thing as feeling it emotionally. The point that as long as you're an equity investor, you're susceptible to very disruptive events. And those disruptive events have come and gone. And the outcome for equity investors, especially ones that are reinvesting dividends, especially those that need to withdraw the dividends, especially those that own high quality companies that are appropriately diversified, et cetera, the outcome has been unbelievable. Not just for the last 10 years since financial crisis, but for every single decade of the life of every person in this room. And the reason for that is not magic, it's not the Fed, it's not the occupant of the White House, it's because free enterprise works and profit making is a glorious thing and we get a chance to monetize in liquid form the profit making of others. That's what equity investing is. It works. It just presents these periods like March of 2020 that get outside our comfort zone. And I will I say over and over again, I don't get phased when there's those 2% drops and those 5% drops and we, and we had you know 57 times the market had been down between 2 and 10%. Those things don't get, get to me much. And, and I wish they didn't get to clients, but I understand it. But, you know, someone says, I won't even blink if, unless the market's in my portfolio is down 18%. And then they call you and it's down 3%. And you go, okay, well, that's human nature. I get it. Then I make some notes in Salesforce. And <laughs> that, that's all right, though. See, see all of you are human. But um, the, I have the ability as a professional investment advisor and the, and the partners and advisors at the Bonson Group have this ability to not be phased by the, the mundane of 2 to 10% movements. All of us were shaken. 
by March of last year. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to put any pretense around it. Those events are disruptive to you, and they're even disruptive to professionals like ourselves who have lived through many of these. And I try to, to appeal to history and try to appeal to experience, try to appeal to the things I've gone through and, and make the right decisions through it all. But my point is that the comfort zone issue, there is not this sort of magical spot where you go, I'm comfortable with anything here, and then just sort of make sure it never violates that. Risk assets can really violate one's comfort zone and, and being able to understand what that means, price it into the way in which your portfolio is allocated, and then have that discipline to stick to it was, it was an incredibly important lesson. And I think that if there's anything I would be worried about out of the aftermath of the COVID moment is, see, my first bear market managing money for other people for a living, that bear market lasted from March of 2000 to October of 2002. And the financial crisis was, was, <laughs> was pretty bad. But that market peaked um, in October of 2007, and it bottomed in, in, uh, on March 9th of, of 2009. That was 18 months. And, and there, were, there were gyrations and things along the way, but there also was a 40% you know, drop in national housing prices. There was a complete and total collapse of the global financial system. So we had bigger fish to fry. But my point is 18 months was not three years. Uh, still pretty bad. But one month was neither 18 months or three years. We've had bear markets that have lasted a lot longer than one month. And the, the quickness and rapidity of the recovery out of COVID should not soften your awareness of this point that, that I have on the screen about comfort zone. Markets can and will violate your comfort zone. And in the COVID moment, it, it, it recovered quicker than we would have expected. And the next time it may not, it may take longer. Now I have a plan for all that. Everything's okay. The dividends are still gonna pay. At lower prices, the dividends are still gonna reinvest if you don't need the money. The withdrawals are gonna be there. There's adequate liquidity. We have alternatives, we have buffers. We have all the things we have to do as investment professionals to deal with it. But that's not gonna change the comfort zone, emotional reality of what will have taken place. I do not say on the screen, lesson number four, that the Fed is your partner as a good thing. I don't necessarily say it as a bad thing because I also believe you can make an argument that whatever the outcome was out of March 2009, it was significantly different the day they announced the TALF facility, the term asset-backed liquidity facility that was there to start buying levered loans and mortgage-backed securities and, yes, even commercial property using an equity buffer given it to it by the Treasury Department that the Fed then levered up as a backdoor way of bailing out the financial system. But the point that out of the financial crisis, Greenspan had always been cutting rates as a, uh, as a put to the stock market. They had always viewed monetary policy as something to ease strains in the financial system, both of the Thai currency crisis in 1997, the Russian ruble crisis in 1998, the failure of long-term capital management hedge fund in 1998, the Y2K concern in 2000, um, after 9-11, he used federal, excuse me, monetary policy operations to soothe financial markets, but out of the financial crisis is when it got real. That's when they quit playing around. Well, they just flat out said, not on our watch. And they ran their balance sheet, $600 billion up to four and a half trillion and left the interest rate at 0% for seven years. So the reality of the Fed and their entry into coddling financial markets, real estate, equities, credit spreads, risk assets, that became a reality. But then something else happened that was not true until the financial crisis and that is the blowout level of national debt. Now, we always have had national debt, but we had a lot of years where our budget deficit, and this is where, this is where Vice President Dick Cheney, in his famous line, which is always taken way out of context, was not wrong. He said, deficits don't matter. He specifically said, deficits do not matter when 
the rate of deficit growth is less than the rate of nominal GDP growth. The rate or uh, the speed at which the deficit is growing has been far higher than the rate of nominal GDP growth. And that is really the main issue, is the national debt has skyrocketed, and now, into the COVID moment, super-duper skyrocketed on top of what was already trillion-dollar-plus budget deficits. So you have the Fed there to cushion distress in financial markets, and now the Fed saying, wait a second, the United States government has to run massive deficits and someone has to not finance them, monetize them directly, because we can't do that in our country the way they can in Japan, but someone has to enable the monetization of the debt. And they use accounting, gimmickry, and other tools, all of which are, are legal, but somewhat problematic to get around doing that. So your bank account, your mortgage, your stock portfolio, your bond portfolio, and anything else you can think of. You don't think about the Fed. I don't know how many of you know what J-PAL looks like. But they are a partner in your balance sheet. And they sure as hell are a partner in the balance sheet of the United States country, in the Treasury Department. This is not going to change. In fact, it's going to grow significantly. And this is something that now is going to represent an issue I have to, and, and the investment professionals of the Bonson Group have to deal with for the rest of our careers. And, and I think it is a lesson that should have been better appreciated, should have been understood post-financial crisis, post-COVID. There's no more ambiguity about it. What I'm simply putting up on the screen is magnify some of the more practical, actionable lessons of the COVID year that we sought to magnify uh, the principles we believed in and apply into the way we're allocating client portfolios. The changing realities of bonds. I don't care if you think the 10 year is going to 2%, going back to 1%, it's sitting about 1.6 right now. Nobody is funding their retirement goals on an after tax, after inflation yield of zero. And that's what the 10 year offers a negative real interest rate. Um, there is a zero bound short term interest rate that I think is going to stay zero bound for a very long time to come. And the idea of bonds as an anchor in a portfolio to hedge really significant risk events and provide a carry of income, those days are gone. I do not actually believe they're ever coming back, but I'm totally willing and hopeful to be wrong about that. What I do know is they're not coming back right now, and I got to manage your money right now the changing reality of where we implement bonds. Another key principle out of what we're calling our magnify lessons, something I will never, ever, ever do differently again in my career, is our mindset of separating credit, credit bonds, credit risk, from what we call boring bonds, these treasuries, high-grade municipals, high-grade corporate bonds, debt instruments that don't have a lot of credit risk or any credit risk, versus debt instruments that have credit risk. They never belong together. It was the marketeers at the big Wall Street firms that put them together so they could go market a bond fund that had a bunch of treasuries and safe stuff in it and throw some junk in it and then say, look, now you have a higher yield. And when I say junk, I don't mean that as a pejorative. Although I can see why you might take it that way. I didn't make up that term. They did that to demonize Milken. The fact of the matter is that credit has a different risk reward profile than safe bonds. So they never should be juxtaposed together. They can sit in an account together, but we have to think about it differently. The way we construct your portfolio, the way we review your risk and reward, the way we view your liquidity needs, the way we uh, monitor your performance, viewing credit and boring bonds differently is something that is a key takeaway for me out of the COVID moment that we've implemented at the Monson Group. Increased use of alternatives, Ability to provide a pursuit of return without increasing equity beta, without increasing equity volatility, and yet recognizing the diminished return expectation from bonds. So we can't get a free lunch. The alternatives have risk too. They just won't have the same risk as your equity portfolio. They won't have the same return-free dynamic of, of your bond portfolio. Now we have to take the risk of a manager executing. Whole bunch of our hedge funds executed 
like crazy last year. Beautiful, brilliant, lovely results. One or two of them did not, really just one of them. And since then has been recovering like crazy. But my point is we diversify equity risk away with alternatives and invite manager risk. And we take the trade off consciously and opportunistically. And this doesn't apply to everyone in the room, but the increased use of directs, direct investments, illiquid investing, where people have the liquidity ability to do so, where they don't need to access the money, but they have a portfolio that enables them to pursue the re risk and return um, characteristics of a direct investment, whether it be a piece of real estate, whether it be private equity, whether it be closely held business, um, those types of investments. Now, since we left Morgan Stanley and are independent, we have more deal flow than almost any private wealth firm you could imagine. And we've been able to source deals for clients where appropriate that I think have been absolute home runs and will continue to be. And then finally, the targeted use of income enhancement things that are intended to enhance the yield above and beyond the normal organic yield of a stock and bond portfolio, and the targeted use of growth enhancement, things that invite greater volatility, greater degree of equity risk for the purpose of a higher total return, riskier asset classes, whether it be innovation-oriented, small cap equity, emerging markets, things like that. We are not gonna waste the risk budget of a client who has a certain tolerance for up and down movement with income enhancement when the client doesn't need income enhancement. We're not gonna waste the risk budget on greater access, uh, 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 exposure to these growth enhancers when the client doesn't need growth enhancement, when they're perfectly content with the return objective of the more conventional portfolio. So we use growth enhancement when there's an objective to enhance growth. Stop me if I'm going too fast. <laughs> we use income enhancement when there's an objective to enhance income. Very quickly on the last two, it's not really so much out of the COVID moment, but it's the COVID year. Did you know that I got, I swear to you, I'm not making this up. I exaggerate things sometimes, but I only do that because I have to, because I have kids at home and I lie to them constantly. <laughs> Just, yeah, I don't have a choice. I'm not exaggerating that there were 25 calls or emails from clients for every one. And here's what the 25 was. Oh my God, the election could be awful. We got to get out. 25 of those for every one in the middle of March. Oh my God, the whole country is going to die. We got to get out. The COVID moment produced 125th as much of the communication of client fear. And, and that's very normal. Uh, there was plenty of that that went on in the last administration and plenty of it went on in the administration before that. It was more this year than I'd ever seen. I wrote about this a lot. We did a white paper about this. I did a lot of recap after the election. Um, there's a whole lot of reasons for it. You're welcome to ask me about it in Q and A. What you're not welcome to do is dispute the basic facts. That sometimes what people expect out of a political outcome pre creates a totally different market outcome. There's not a whole bunch of stupid people out there pulling the strings of the market that perhaps we are the ones overthinking the connectivity between politics and markets. And then on the other side of that coin, I just can't even begin to tell you how few people appreciate what makes a stock price move. Not what makes a stock price move lower in the midst of levered cascading panic financial selling. We've talked about that. But and the ebb and flow throughout time as to where you actually get growth of an asset price, growth of cash flow that leads to that dividend we care about so much, where this comes from, why a multiple will be at 15, 16, or in some cases, 23, 24 times is because of profit expectations, profit realities, and profit growth. It's always and forever connected to corporate profits. Why did the market begin recovering so far in advance of the economy recovering, not just in COVID, but in the financial crisis and in every other market setback in history? 
because the markets began to discount ahead of time the reality of recovered profits. And why do profits recover quicker than the economy? Why do profits recover quicker than government actions? Why do profits recover quicker than so many other things that are outside of the hands of the private sector? Because profits are controlled by people operating in their own self-interest to generate a return on capital. And they're done by brilliant, often brilliant. See, there's imperfect people. There's bad operators. There's bad CEOs. They usually get fired. There's bad boards. Sometimes the whole board gets fired. So that stuff happens. People talk like that's some disproof of capitalism. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. People make mistakes and they get fired. They get replaced. And someone else comes in and maybe the business is broken, move on to a different business. Maybe they fix the business. They have a new product, new innovation. This is the way it's supposed to work. That's what drives stocks. And when we have a COVID moment and a 9-11 moment and all these different things that really, really put downward pressure on the whole macro environment of risk asset investing, nothing's ever going to change this fact that the only reason I have you invested in equities is I believe in the profit-making potential of the free market. That's what we're invested in. It's a philosophical statement that translates into an economic one. And out of an economic one, it translates into a real-life tangible benefit from which you fund your life dreams, goals, and pursuit of contentment. That's it. That's the story. Profits are underrated. Politics is overrated. In conclusion, I've already said everything I have to say. <laughs>